Okay, so continuing from last time, right? So last time, basically, we got to an equation of the following form. We, we said the one power, the power extracted by the blade, right, by the turbine, is the total power, power in one multiplied by the CP number, which is the coefficient of performance. Right? So what we care about uh, that CP value, basically. So again, total power, we cannot, not something we can control. Coefficient of performance is something we can control, in principle. So CP, this is an important number. Okay, so this is the number of importance. We want to control this number. So the first equation we got is fairly elegant, but uh, so gamma is the ratio of the downwind speed uh, to the upwind speed. So it's a number between zero and one. And CP turns out to be this, turns out to be this number. Okay. So it's a fairly elegant equation. It uh, makes sense, it's something between zero and one. The dependence is not too complicated. So the issue with this equation is it's not very explicit how you will control CP when you're operating the turbine. Right, so the upwind speed is something you cannot control. The downwind speed is something you can't. Because that depends on how your turbine operates, that's sort of how much wind get, what's the speed of wind uh, downstream from the turbine. But that's not very explicit in this equation. Right? So it's hidden in this equation. So then we thought, well, a more explicit equation, okay, this is the same equation, writing another way, is let's define another ratio called lambda. This is the vertical speed of the tip of the turbine, right? how fast the turbine is moving, divided by the upwind speed. So this is another ratio for speed. And then if you plug this equation into the coefficient of performance, you, we get this sort of more complicated looking equation, but something that's or slightly more uh, engineering wise, a little bit sort of more explicit. Because I can control the tip of the speed of the wind blades, of the blades. So this is saying to control the speed of the turbine, to control the power you draw, to control the performance, what you, should, what you should do is control how fast your turbine turns. Okay, but control how fast your turbine turns, this controls the collision performance. Right. So you can try to, for example, maximize the CP number. So that's a goal when we do this kind of control. Right. Last time we basically got to this point, right? we got to this equation. Okay, so it's a, these two equations are exactly the same equation. Okay, they should give you the same number. They will always give you the same number. They're just one substituting to the other. So whichever one you use, depending on the information you have in the problem. So the information gives you, you know, downwind speed, use the first one. If the question gives you the tip speed ratio, this lambda, then you see, uh, you see the, right? So it depends on which equation, the information you're given in the problem. Okay. okay, so last time we saw then by varying this, let's say by varying CP, by varying lambda, the operation of wind turbine looks something like this, right? If you look at the speed of wind, Let's say this is the speed of wind. This is the power you draw of the turbine. You have some cutting speed, right? So the turbine starts generating power at some non-zero speed. It ramps up. It becomes a constant at some rate of power, then drops down fairly quickly. So you cannot operate at very high. Okay. So this is the, sort of the operating curve of a wind turbine depending on the upwind speed. And this operating curve, so here, is where you want to max CP. Okay, so when you're ramping up on this edge, the wind speed is not very high. So to get the ramp the power up, you should maximize it. Draw the mouse as you can. So that's where in the leading edge, you're trying to 
max CT. When you're operating at this rated power, we offer at this rated power, then your goal is no longer to maximize CT. Okay, your goal is to change CT to track this rated power. Okay, so here is change CT. To make sure you're operating at the rated power you have. Okay, so it's quite so. When we talk, often we talk about the coefficient of performance. You will think you want to try to maximize, try always try to maximize it. That's not that's not always the case. Depending on when, sometimes you try to reduce it. Okay, so it's a number you can really control, right? Between a range. Okay, and the reason to have this kind of a profile for one turbine is. We want something that's called a variable speed turbine. Right? We want a turbine that can operate at a different wind speed. We, we, we want, so we don't want a turbine that just operate when the wind, for example, is 10 meters per second. We want a turbine operating over a wide range of wind conditions. Okay? So that's all modern turbines as, you know, are variable speed turbines. So these are, So they don't need what to be at a particular speed. And the way this happens is you can just track CT. You can just you know, change CT. Okay, so there's a lot of ways you can track this. There's a lot of ways you can make sure that you offer a rate of power. And when we look at different uh, types of turbines, different generators, basically the idea is how do we achieve, how do we track uh, this rate of power? So when we, again, when we're first, so a very early turbine. So this is, let's say 1960s, you know, 70s. When we first start putting reasonably large wind turbines, the profile did not look like that. Our profile looks something like this. The turbine will operate at some cutting speed, will ramp up very quickly, and offer something like this. So the turbine will only generate power for a very limited range of wind. And this is the reason because we, uh, very earlier on, we did not have a very good idea how to control turbines, how to track, how to, you know, how to uh, change pitch, how to use high electronics, how to, how to maintain a steady operation. So we designed the turbine to offer uh, some wind speed. If it deviates away from that wind speed, we won't offer the turbine. Okay, so before it's not very, you know, so at that time, turbines were not very reliable. As we get better and better, we can offer it at a larger and larger range of wind. Okay, so this class is, you can think of as how do you, you know, get from this picture to this picture. And there's ways to go from, uh, to get better at operating turbines. Right. Okay, so that's our variable speed. And most of the time, the actual control mechanism we have is a pitch angle, okay, is a pitch angle. So if you look at the CP equation, we have this tip speed ratio, right? That depends on the velocity of the tip of the blade, the speed of the tip of the blade. That again is not a direct control variable. You cannot go to a, you know, you cannot tell a turbine to say, I want this V tip to be some number. You cannot set that number. What you can control is a pitch angle. Okay, so our direct actuation is on the pitch angle. And hopefully the pitch angle is related to this V tape by some, you know, there's some relationship between them. And by changing the pitch angle, then we can change the, uh, we're able to change CP. Okay, so pitch angle is the, beta is our direct actuation. So that's why pitch control is important because that's from a most, a lot of times are the only thing we can do. But the main thing we can do is change the pitch of the blade. We have mechanical control of that. And through that, we'll control other things. Okay, by changing beta, we'll you know, indirectly change this V tip and that will change the CP equation. Okay, so by changing beta, we can trace out different curves like this. Okay. 
And then, okay, any questions for this? Any questions for this curve? Okay, so the thing to remember is pitch control is fundamentally the, in some sense, the number one thing we can control for one place. Yeah, so everything is, most things are done through a pitch control. So then the question becomes is how do I find this function? <laughs> Here I just wrote a function. I'm saying, okay, this, you know, how fast your turbine is going depends on your pitch through some function. How will you find this function? Right? To control the turbine, I should have some idea of what this function is. So if you are going to fill the function, how will you find this function? Right, so the answer is, right, so in class, let's get some data, let's try to fit whatever this equation comes out to be. That's actually right. So if you want to talk about data-driven things, we started very early. We started doing this in the 70s. And some grad student, actually from our department, will go to California, put off a turbine, and spend three months fitting this curve. So you were a grad student in this department at that time, and there's a good chance you're spending three months at the desert in California trying to figure this curve out. Yeah, so this is you get data and fit the curve. It's very hard to come up with a first principle equation for this. So that, that is very difficult to do. Okay, so most time is you just go out and measure it and uh, whatever curve comes out to be, you say that's a curve. So for example, this is actual curve gotten by some uh, poor student in the, uh, in the 80s, in our department, we have an Ashikawi student. I don't know how they come up with this functional form. Okay, I'm not sure who guessed this is the right functional form. And these are the parameters that should go into it. But well, those folks, you know, figured out this was a curve. And then if you can measure different beta and different tips to ratios, you fit this, you know, equation, right? I'm not going to, yeah, I don't know how they got, I don't know how they guessed it. Like I asked Muhammad, you know, who came up with this functional form? Like who guessed this? And they weren't sure. Like after a while, they thought this was a good fit. Right? So you, if you look at this curve, it's quite complicated. There are seven parameters that goes into the curve. It's a mixture of squares and cubes and exponentials and all that. But that's the idea, you know, in practice, how you would obtain this kind of curves. Okay, in practice, so if you go out, you get data, you fit the best you can, and this is your curve. All right, and you have a bunch of parameters that describe this figure. Okay, so here I'm plotting, you know, a number of uh, curves depending on this parameters. So they look something reasonable, but that's just what comes up. All right, so nowadays, of course, you would not explicitly fit this type of curves anymore. So before as you collect a big table of data, you fit this curve. So nowadays, most likely what you do is you actually would fit a neural network. That'll be much easier than guessing this parametric form. Okay, so now this is collect data, you turn in your network, and that will probably fit better than this explicit function that they come up with. Anyways, the idea is similar as you start, you know, you get data and fit a function. Okay? And then depending on individual turbines, you tune the parameters you have. You tune these parameters, you, know, you uh, when you put a turbine online, you tune these parameters a little bit to get the best performing shape best performing question. Okay. So in your homework or in the exams, you may see a question like CP is described by this equation. Okay, go, you know, plot the equation and read something from the equation, right? That's where this equation come from. It's uh, not much first principle behind it. It's sort of more of a data and curve fitting. Questions about this? Okay, so again, the thing to remember is in practice, again, your beta is really your control variable. You're trying to 
vary beta and uh, maximize or control the CP. Okay, and then to do maximum power tracking, what you would do is basically by changing beta, right? So if you change a beta and you plot the CP versus tip speed ratio plot, then what you want to do is you want to keep track operate at the top of the curve. So this is called a maximum power tracking. Okay, as you, by maximizing CP, you can maximize the power of the blade you get. Okay, so sometimes we want to track maximum power. This is what we would do. Okay, so again, this is done most times empirically. So if you see a question like this in the homework, you have an empirical equation, and you may be asked to find what the maximum is. And there is really, you can just plot the curve and read it off. Uh, you don't want to, for example, differentiate this curve and solve for zero, because that, that's not a, a very easy derivative to do. Okay, so if you see a question like this, the way to solve it is to plot the curve and from the graph read off what the maximum is. Okay. Right, so this is our maximum speed uh, power tracking is again changing beta, track power. I have a question so, about that graph. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so you said you can control CP with the with the pitch, but then yeah. how do you within that pitch, how do you control how do you get to the maximum? I don't get how you get to that maximum. That's all. Oh, okay. So what you do is you don't so it's not within the pitch you go to the max. It's by changing the pitch, what you do is you move along this red line while changing the pitch. Okay. So when we change the pitch. We move along a line in this plot. Right? So when we change the pitch, what do we change? We change both which which of these curve we're looking at, and we're changing lambda the tip speed ratio. So we're moving in this plot. Right? So let's say I start here. If I change the pitch, what do I do? Is I you know I go to some other point. Right? I go to some other point if I change the pitch. So the goal is to track this red line, which gives you the maximum power. So to be more, I guess, uh, so if you, let's, so let's draw this again. Right? So let's say you're a, let's say this is, I'm gonna plot the lambda versus power plot here. And let's say I'm operating at this point. Okay, let's say I'm operating currently at this point, uh, some pitch angle beta. So now let's say I change beta. So this is uh, some beta. I change beta. Then two things change. Lambda depends on beta. Lambda depends on beta. CP depends on beta. So if I go from, let's say this is some beta one. Now let's say I operate at beta two. Okay, I operate at beta two, right? So what happens is I have some other lambda, let's say lambda increases a little bit and I have some other CP. So I got a new operating point. Okay, so this is a new operating point at beta two. Right. This is another operating point. If I change the pitch angle, I change both lambda and C. So I could, you know, I could go up, I could go down, but let's say in this case, our lambda increases a little bit and our uh, power increases a little bit. So I move up this way, okay? So the goal is, right? So you basically, you want to change. So there's a way to change beta such that you go in this direction. Right? So this is the direction you want to go. You want to increase uh, maximum, let's say you want to maximize the power you're generating. So you can change beta to move along this lot. That will increase the power you can generate. Okay. I guess I guess my the main question I have then is 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 there another way to change lambda? No. Change beta? no. Beta is the main control variable you have. So everything depends on beta. 
So this curve can move in complicated ways. Okay, this curve, so here I drew it. Assuming, oh, there's a straight line, I just need to trace a straight line. Actually, where you offer it is you know, more complicated. It's not always obvious how to change beta to maximize power. I guess it's not always obvious how to do that. But there is some beta that will maximize the power you can get. Right? Your goal is to find that beta. Okay? Your goal is to find that beta. So again, so beta is the only control variable you have. So everything depends on beta. Everything depends on beta. Okay, so there is a, by changing beta, you change everything. And then that's how you figure out the power you can. Excuse Another me. I have a question about, about the graph above. Yeah. Above. Yeah. So here you, is, there is something beta three is it greater than beta two? Uh, yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, just to make sure. Yeah, so, is, okay. yeah, so this, as beta gets, so again, it's not obvious that the increasing beta will increase power, decreasing beta will decrease power. <laughs> so it's trying to illustrate that, yes, yeah, so it's trying to illustrate that when you want to uh, track a specific power level, you control beta, and then the operating point moves in this space, moving in this sort of two-dimensional space. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so move. And again, it's not obvious this is a monotonic relationship at all. Right? So you got, I say this is your equation, something like this. Okay, it's not obvious things are monotonic or how you will change beta or how we, how we optimize this. But there, this is just saying that beta is your main control variable. Okay, think of the power being generated as a function of beta. Then by changing beta, I can change the power I generate. Good question. Any other questions on this? You do have a question in the chat. Uh, it's from Ishan, and it's asking, uh, when would we want to track max power as opposed to rated power? Uh, okay, good. So, yes. So, thanks for reading that out. So, going back to the earlier part, is we want to track the maximum power when the wind speed is now very high. So, if the when speed is such that the maximum power we can generate is below the rated power, then we want to go to the maximum power. So that's the first part of this curve. So we're here, right? So here we want to track max power, okay? As the first part of the curve, right? So because we want to get to a rated power, there's not enough energy in when to get it. So we try to get as close as possible. Then once we get to the rate of power, then we're actually not always increasing CP. We're trying to decrease CP to offer at the rate of power. And so modern turbines has a fairly large operating range at rate of power. So also you see both sort of tracking the maximum power and try to you know, limit the power you get. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, good. So this is the power tracking. So these key measures, remember, is we're changing beta and uh, we're uh, tracking power. So, so before we talk about, you know, number of blades in the wind turbine, so there are some two bladed turbines out there. There are some two blade turbines. If you compare a two blade turbine with a three blade turbine, it just two blade turbine needs to spin faster to get the same CP as a three blade turbine. So some small turbines are cubulated, and often in those cases, you see faster speed. In this class, we would very rarely see uh, cubulate turbines, but just they, they spin at a slightly faster rate if you ever encounter them in practice. Okay, so this is another answer in the question of tracking power, right? So from A to B, uh, you, you know, the wind is very low, so not much control. From B to C, you track the maximum power. Then from C to E, you're power limited. Okay, so you stay at your rated power. Right? So this is how you map, how do we set data? Okay, 
so we said, so before we, I said is you can control beta to change how much power generating. So in practice, how do you do that? So we don't have enough control background to go into as the exact control mechanisms that happen in each, in each box. The high level story is that there are sophisticated feedback control mechanisms in the turbine that will try to optimize the pitch. That will try to optimize the pitch. So the mechanisms are one is you measure how fast your turbine is going. Okay? So this is what this will get idea. Basically, this is the V tip, right? How fast am I going? This is my Samsung gives you the tip speed ratio. This is how much power I have, right? This is sort of the power uh, deviation. Right? How much power do I have compared to the power I want to get? Then all of that goes into a function that decides beta. So beta is changed in real time. Okay, so beta is changed quite rapidly in real time. And the way is you measure basically, this is the power you generate, this is how you want to generate, pick a difference. This is the speed you have, this is the speed you want, pick a difference. Both of these deviations fits into this control box that will give you okay. So this is the feedback control mechanism we have. In, we have. Okay. So again, of course, beta in turn determines the actual uh, rotation of the speed of the blade. Beta also determines the power you generate. So this whole thing is a constant, you know, constant feedback. So you're changing beta, you change your input, and you have error, you try to you know, make the error go to zero. So this is a very good illustration of the control, sort of feedback control uh, boxes you have seen in your control class. Okay. Questions for this uh, block diagram? So the challenges here is that none of these boxes are linear. So the main challenge is nothing here is linear. We're controlling a nonlinear system where the dynamics is quite complicated. Right? So re again, remember the seventh order equation we have seen for beta to CT. Okay, so we have a complicated nonlinear system. You're trying to do this feedback design. Trying to do this feedback design. And uh, it's not trivial to even show the system is stable. Okay, so if you take a linear control, there's simple theory to say when the system is stable, when the system is optimal and all that. Here, we don't have that. It's not easy to get that theory. So you still see today, even today, you still see accidents happen when you have big turbines. May still go unstable. That's not because you know, we don't know it should be stable, it's, it's just not in your system. Sometimes you know, things go wrong in the linear system. Right, so we won't go deeper into this. This is sort of way beyond the math that is required for this class. So if you're interested in this, now this is something, for example, we're doing research. And how do we decide, you know, how do we design this process? How do we make sure everything's stable? Okay. Any questions about this feedback? Okay, good. So, so this is again a more drawn out diagram. This gives you some idea of the pitch mechanism we can use in uh, say in transfer functions. But again, we're not going to look too much into this. We don't have the prerequisite now. Okay. So last thing in this sort of talking about one power is we want to talk about the farms. Right. So everything before was about a single turbine. Everything before is you have a single turbine. Right, so this is your turbine. This is, you know, how, how do we control the pitch? How do we control how much power do we generate and so on? It's, you know, what happens when we have many of them in your farm? Okay, what, nowadays, it's, again, you very rarely see one turbine at a time. As you see a farm of them, right? you see a lot of them stacked to, uh, close to, uh, lots of them together in an area. So this makes sense. 
right? So a cluster of wind turbines and wind farm makes sense, right? You're gonna buy a land, you may just buy, you know, you're gonna have to buy land anyways. You have to install transmission lines anyways. You may just, well, you know, uh, install a lot of them in a small area, okay? This uh, simplifies the grid connection a lot. Because in, in, instead of having each turbine connecting to the grid individually, what happens in a farm is they can all connect to each other together. And then the whole thing connects to the grid. That saves a lot of money when you're building the uh, infrastructure. It's easy to maintain, right? It's easier to operate. You have lots of them together. So that's why you see farms all the time. Right? Most times we see our wind farms. Okay, so you do see, you know, onshore, offshore, lots of them, many different examples arranged in different ways. The main trick, the tricky thing of wind farms is you, it's hard to, so a wind farm is not just a collection of individual turbines. How they operate influence each other. But as wind passes through one of them, you know, downward, downwind speed is reduced, has to go through the next turbine. So, so the next turbine after, where it has smaller power is available, all of that. Okay, so we need to maintain some separation between the turbines. They cannot be too close together. You want to have the wind take off some speed. You want to avoid turbulence, right? You want to provide a good separation distance. So in practice, this is fairly complicated. How do you separate? What is the optimal arrangement of turbines in farms? You know, how does that depend on the area you're operating in? So that is again, a fairly uh, active area of research. Actually, if you're given a set of areas, how do you place a turbine? It's not trivial, okay? But here, what we are gonna do is we're gonna look at a very simple arrangement. So we're going to make some very simple geometric assumptions and then come up with a rule of thumb to say how far they should be. Okay, we want a rule of thumb. We're not going to do the optional placement, but we'll get some ideas how far they should be. Okay. So let's, let's say the turbines are arranged in a square array pattern. Okay, so we're going to put them nicely on a square array they're all separated by the same distance. Okay, they're all separated by the same distance. So the distance between two turbines, let's say this is D. Okay, there are some separation between the two turbines. Okay. And the right trade-off we want to look at is not simply just a distance, but rather we want to say, if you build bigger and bigger turbines, so the blades get longer and longer, how would that impact how far you have to separate? Okay, so it's a ratio that matters. For example, if you're, you know, each of these are very small turbines, then D could be smaller. If they're very large, then D can be larger. So the trade-off we have is we're gonna look at the ratio of this separation ratio. So S is a ratio. S is D divided by how big your two are. So how big the turb each turbine is. Right, so we'll get a rule of thumb for how large S should be. Okay, so you know. Okay, so again, it's not the absolute distance that matters, it is this ratio that matters. Okay, so the bigger the turbine you build, the farther away you have to separate them, the smaller, the smaller the distance. Okay. So again, it's hard to have an analytical expression for this. This is again mostly determined by experiments. Okay, so you start, let's say, with some array, let's say a 10 by 10 array. You keep trying your different separation distance and you measure the efficiency you have and you draw a curve like this. Okay, so the, of course, the smaller the separation, the less efficient the array, right? When it loses speed, you don't get all the power and you get sort of less power for the rest of the turbines. But then of course, the bigger the separation, you need more land. Right? So if you have very large separation, 
to you know you're being very efficient, but then you need to need a bigger area. So there's a type of a trade-off curve like this. Okay, so you want to offer it at some point on this trade-off curve. Okay. Any questions now? Okay. Yeah. Right. No, so the right, so S is the separation divided by the blade. So larger S means D is larger, right? Mm -hmm. D is larger, right? So this is S, so increase, so S large, right? So D larger. So D over two R. Right? So larger the separation, the more efficient things are. Right? So larger separation, it's as if the turbines are opening on their own. Okay, good. Any other questions? Okay, so again, to determine this kind of curve, if somebody goes out of the field and tries it out. And different areas have different curves. So again, a lot of modeling goes into this. A lot of hard work to determine the actual curve. Right. And again, you know, the trade off is how much land do you have? Right. It's easy to say that I'll just have large separation. Right. Easy to say, oh, I'll just have a large separation between the turbines. But the trade off is if you have a fixed area of land, then if you have larger separation, you can't place that many turbines. Okay, so that's the, you want to find a separation, that makes sense, that makes sense, but also allows you to place enough turbines to make your investment worth it, okay. All right, so that's the calculation people do. So if you work for a wind power company, for example, or you work for a utility who's placing turbines, you'll be doing a lot of this type of calculations. You know, given this in my area, how many turbines can I put? If one, or, you know, should I purchase more area? This kind of idea has been computed. Okay. Questions? I have a quick question about the yeah, um, efficiency. So yeah. it efficiency, of course, increases as separation increases. Is yeah. that because the areas downwind grow and then they interact with each other? Uh, if they're too close together, like, turbulence and vortices and whatnot? Yes, they are too close. One is you lose downwind speed. And then second is you have turbulence. Yeah. So larger separation means, you know, the downwind speed, the impact of, you know, downwind speed is less, and then you avoid turbulence. Good, okay, so this is the trade-off we're thinking about, right? So. Again, the actual computation, what you do in practice, you work for a company, it's quite complicated. You have a lot of consulting companies nowadays doing this kind of thing, making this kind of calculation. There are people using supercomputers to simulate wind flow and then putting turbines and then try to do this kind of thing without you know, going to the field, right? So there's all this advanced computation coming in. So the rule of thumb is uh, what we do is we're not going to compute any of them. We're going to just look at uh, uh, some typical numbers people in practice use. We're going to look at some typical numbers. And for those typical numbers, we'll make a very simple assumption. We will say the wind is blowing in one direction with respect to the square array. Okay, so that again never happens. But for this class, that's what I'm going to say. If you along the direction of the wind, if you along that direction, you need a bigger separation, okay? If you're along that direction, you need a bigger separation, right? So your D2 is along the wind direction. You need this 10 R or 20 R distance. You want to really separate them out because this is the direction of wind flow. Okay? You want to avoid turbulence, you know, avoid having a downwind speed that's too low. This is what you have. Then the direction that's perpendicular to the wind direction, this is sort of smaller than D2, right? Because wind is really not blowing in that direction. So you can get away with a fairly small separation. 
Okay, and 6R is a really small separation. That's sort of barely longer than the two blades together, uh, than the two turbines, okay? So these are the rule of thumbs we're using this class. We'll assume that wind is flowing a, you know, in a direction that's oriented the same way with our grid. Now, obviously this doesn't happen in practice, but this is the assumption. So the thing to remember is depending on how you're aligned with one direction, then there's different separations we have. And uh, you really cannot pack them cl any closer than this. Packing them any more closer will get you into a turbulence region. And you really want to avoid turbulence when you're building wind turbine. Okay. Right, so these are the rule of thumb to remember. So let's do a calculation, this example, okay? So let's say I have a 10 by 10 wind farm, so 100, right? Wind farm with 100 turbines, you know, square array with a separation factor of seven. Okay? There's a factor of seven. Assuming the efficiency is 85%, CP is 0.4, and the wind power density at the hub height is one, uh, kilometers per meter squared. So the idea is you want to get a power production per unit area of land. Okay, so if you buy a land, how much power do you get per unit of land? Right. Okay, so we what we do is we compute how large the land is, compute how much total power we're generating, and divide that to get a number. You see per meter squared, how much power we can generate. So, right, so again, so we have some grid like this. Right, so this is our 10 by 10 grid. So this has distance D. So D here is, remember, S is D over 2R but D is 2R times S. Okay, so our area, right, so the area of land we're using So those are the equation we gave here. This is area of land, right? The reason this is not just uh, 10 times D is you have to take care of the edge effect here. Okay, so the reason this equation looks a little bit weird, right, you, it's not just X number of uh, turbines times D, but there's an edge effect of R here. because so you take care of that edge. Okay, so the idea is to always look at this equation and use it. Okay, don't assume it's just 10 times D is, you know, X minus one times D plus a two R at each end the edge effect of the, of the uh, length of the blade at each end. So this is our equation we want to use. So coming here, we have 10 minus one plus two R, whole thing squared. This is 16, four R squared, okay? So we're gonna carry the R squared because R squared will divide out anyways. R squared divides out. Because right, we're calculating everything per meter squared. So R squared will divide out. And then we have total of 10 by 10, 100 turbines. Okay, so let's compute the power production we have. So the power of the entire farm uh, the hundred, the number of turbines we have, multiply by the uh, power generator of each turbine. So this is our rho, this is the power density. Times eta, this is the efficiency. Times CP, this is our coefficient of performance. Times area of a blade of the turbine. Okay, so this is the total power uh, we generate in this farm. Okay. So multiplying everything together, 
Okay, so this really modify all this. Your efficiency is 0.85. Our CP is 0.4. Okay, our CP is 0.4. We're modifying by the area, which is pi r squared. Okay, so to modify all of this all together, we get the 85.45 r squared kilowatts. So this is the, how much power we generate all together. So if you look at the power production, Uh, per area of land, this is eight five four five zero divided by the land we have. One six three eight four r squared. Five point two watt per meter square. Okay, so this is just uh, how much power we have per unit square of length. So it's a smaller number than what you would imagine. Okay, watt per meter square is not terribly impressive. Okay, so this means you probably doesn't, it's not worth your while to invest in this one part. Okay, but normally when you compute those kind of numbers, it's not a very large number. It's not a hugely large number. It's be, again, because you have to separate all the turbines by quite a bit. Okay, you have a lot of separation, you need a very large land. So per meter squared is not a terribly large number. So this is actually similar. For often when you do this per meter square calculation, wind will come out to be similar to solar. We may think wind turbines are each, you know, a lot larger than what solar panels are. But what if you do per unit, per land area calculation, this for far, and it's not too far away from each other, okay? So this, when you're making business decisions, this is often the calculation you do in the back of the envelope. You look at how much money does it take to get a meter square of land, and then it's worth being solvent, right? So you install the turbine. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so this is a typical calculation. The main thing is actually getting the area of the square array correct. Okay, so the main thing people make mistake is this thing here. You really want to go to the slides and use this equation. Okay. So get the edge effect correct. Okay, it's not x times d square. It's a weird uh, edge effect. So that's the most tricky part. Everything else is just a straightforward calculation. Question? I have a question. Um, yeah. Is the efficiency term is that is that a turbine feature or is that was that supposed to be about the farm uh, related to the? the... Oh, this is turbine. So this is the uh, guess. I want to say this is the electric efficiency. So how good your generators are. So your generator is eighty five percent efficient. Other questions? Okay, all right. So uh, now let's take our break. We'll come back at 9.32. Then we'll look at the actual generators, the actual generator part of the class. Okay, for the guys who remember induction machines, everything will come back. All the equations will come back from induction. All right, but okay, so let's take a pause and uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes. Okay, so now we'll transition from the sort of the mechanics part of the class, right? Mechanically, how do you extract power from wind into this torque, rotational torque? Now we're gonna talk about converting it more towards uh, electric power, more towards how do we get electricity out of it? So brief history, brief history is, so Cleveland, Ohio is actually the first place we know of that uh, use a wind turbine to produce electricity. Okay, so Ohio, folks there, Cleveland, install a turbine. That's a picture of the turbine. 
It's a big turbine, of course, it's not a bladed design at that time, but it was able to provide the 12 kilowatt of electricity, which was not bad at that time. It's a respectful amount of power they got. Right, then three years later, sort of, of course, you know, other countries start using wind turbines to generate electricity. So wind turbines was actually quite popular in the 1930s, 1940s. So at that time, if you drove around in rural America, you'll see wind turbines. A lot more than today, actually. Everywhere you drove, you'll see wind turbines. Okay? Because the reason is, it's not connect to the grid. The grid was not a sort of, you know, the countrywide spending grid we have today. And a lot of times, uh, you have no electricity. But what is the easiest thing to do at that time is wind. Build a turbine, turn it, and get some power out of it. Okay? And of, so, you know, today, if you're going to do this, uh, you would do solar, not wind. But at that time, wind was the distributed energy resources we had. So in some sense, come, coming full circle back to this time. Uh, we had a lot of wood at that time. So then this really went away. So the number of wind turbines went away is in the 90 sort of 50s to 1960s, where uh, wind power really declined. Right, right. We build a national grid. Right, right. So, we're doing... so the technology at that time, wind was not quite reliable. You're much better on the national grid rather than building your wind turbine generating power. So that was, uh, you know, so the wind turbine stopped being you know, relevant at that time. Wind turbine came back was again popular in the 1970s. Anybody know the reason? It's super popular in the 1970s for about 10 years. Anybody know history at that time? Was it because of Iran? Right, so that was because of the oil crisis we had in the 1970s. So for folks who don't know, we had actually had a big energy crisis in the 1970s. This was the oil crisis. So there's sort of high interest in wind. So of course, that again stopped after you know, 10 years. After that crisis passed, we stopped building wind turbines again. In the 1990s and to now, right, so there's a renewed interest. Okay, so this is just saying wind is not a new energy. It's not like we never had it before. We had a lot of wind. We sort of stopped and started. And uh, each time we sort of learn how to build better machines, build better turbines. Uh, so hopefully we'll uh, continue to go. We won't have this sort of oscillation in one power, but it's just uh, some historical events. Okay. So after many years, after from you know the 30s to now, after almost 100 years, we settled on this design. And this is called a horizontal axis wind turbine. And so this is again, the vast majority of wind turbines you see are of this type. So you see this being called, this is the HAWT, right? horizontal axis. So the horizontal does not refer to the blade, it refers to the axis of the blade. And that's sort of why it's called a horizontal turbine. Okay, so there's a lot of moving parts in this thing, in this uh, turbine. So you have a, and the largest part we have in the turbine. So what is the most expensive part of the turbine? Is that box I do? What's that box? That's the most expensive part. What is that box we have? Okay. The That's a gearbox, right? So the gearbox is by far the most expensive part, the part that has the most problems. So that's a gearbox. This is our gearbox. That that well, what that gearbox does is right, so remember when we generate power, we generate power at around 60 hertz, right? 60 hertz. Wind turbines do not typically rotate at 60 hertz. They rotate at much 
lower frequency. You do not want to see a turbine that rotating at 60 hertz. Okay, so they're located at a much, much lower speed. But what that gearbox does is well step up the speed. Right? So the gearbox is it goes from low speed to high speed. And then goes to the generator, and the generator generates power. Okay, so this is the uh, setup of the housing of the turbine. And then one another mechanical part of the turbine is you have this sort of called yaw control. And this just turns the turbine. Okay, so you don't know which direction the wind is blowing, so you're turning the turbine. And most turbines now can turn for a fairly wide arc to face a wind. So a lot of moving parts in the mechanical turbine. Okay, so if you draw it out, it's really sort of something look like this. You have a bunch of gears. You try to uh, convert from low speed in the shaft in the hub to higher speed. And you have a generator, you have a transformer, you have the power. Okay, so all these boxes, and they do go wrong. Something happens to these boxes all the time. So maintenance of wind turbine is not trivial. It's just the reason is this big machine, just a lot of moving parts. In the big machine, in the big machine. Okay. So why do we settle on this type of design? Okay, why, why, after all these years, why do we? You know, this is fairly mature design. It's very standard. So the main reason we settle on this design is you can build a very tall tower. Okay, so the main advantage is you build a tall tower. The taller the tower is, the higher the speed of the wind is. Okay, that really allows you to access high speed wind. Right, and uh, again, now, so we saw power scales with cube of speed. So that really gives you bad, you know, bad for your buck. Right? So you want to that, you want to ask, able to access as high power as possible. And then this is fairly high efficiency because if you have a three bladed turbine, as you always get power. Okay, so you all, so this also three phase power system and you sort of get constant power out of this when three blades rotate. So there's a fair constant power and fairly constant speed. Okay, so there's a lot of advantages to this kind of turbine design. Okay, so that's why sort of we settled on this kind of design is we get a lot of power out of it and the power quality is pretty good. So constant power, at least in a short time we get out of it. So what are some of the disadvantages of this? Thing? Anything of some disadvantages of this kind of design? You build a tall tower, you put a turbine, or you build put a horizontal axis turbine on top. Of it. What are some of the drawbacks? It can't rotate 360 degrees to match the wind all the time. Right. So this basically this one is it needs this yaw control, right? And this is not typically 360 degrees. So you cannot turn, you can turn a little bit, but it doesn't, you know, you cannot turn 360 degrees around and this adds cost. You need this mechanism to turn your turbine, but that adds cost to this design. Any other disadvantages? Uh, they require specialized people to maintain them. Right, so that's a good that's a good point. So on the Zoom said it requires special people for maintenance. So maintenance of the turbines is probably the number one issue people have with turbines. It just has a very tall tower. It right? has a, a tall tower. It has heavy gearboxes. A lot of gears there, and it's very hard to maintain. It's very, very hard to actually maintain a turbine. You need to stop it, you need to get somebody up there, take it up, right? This is not a trivial job to maintain. Okay, so there's a lot of moving parts can fail and uh, hard to maintain. So hard maintenance is actually a huge problem we have with turbines, especially offshore ones. If your offshore turbine breaks, uh, you're not gonna maintain un unless a bunch of them all break. It's just not worth the effort to maintain a single turbine. Okay, so you know, that's maintenance is actually day to day a huge problem. So there's one more, there's another reason that's really not engineering, but also a huge part of the uh, drawbacks, this kind of design. 
Is it that they're not aesthetically pleasing? Right. Right. Yeah. So in class, right? So it said not in my backyard. That's actually a big part of it. Right. So it's tall. You know, people. Some people don't like it. And uh, you see them from miles away. Right? So you see them, and uh, if people don't want to look at a turbine. Then that's an issue. Okay, so this is less about engineering, but it's a real, real issue. And there's some local opposition. To it. Okay, so you know, I find it fascinating. But probably most people, you know, if you have a house that's very near a turbine, you may not be too happy to build a turbine close to you. Right? So this is a real issue. Right? So today, most problems are maintenance is really a pain for this turbine. You can build the best turbine you have. If it breaks often, especially these offshore large turbines, it's not clear you know, whether it was the effort to maintain the turbines. Okay, and local opposition is another issue. So because this disadvantage, people actually come up with this kind of vertical access turbines. So you do see this type of turbines from places to place. It's not, common they don't generate that much power but if you need small scale wind power right not in the megawatts but if you need power in the sort of tens of kilowatts or 100 kilowatts you can build this vertical axis turbines okay so again this is called a vertical because the axis rotation is vertical so you don't have a blade anymore you basically uh you know this is 360 view of wind, right? There's no preferred direction of wind anymore. You put the put that, go through a gearbox and generate power. So this has advantages. This sort of uh, counters some of the disadvantages of horizontal access ones. Uh, there's no need to rotate the turbine because uh, sort of it has 360 view of the uh, wind. And another big thing here is everything, so this is a gearbox, the uh, generator are at ground level, which is a huge advantage for maintenance. This is a huge deal if you want to maintain a turbine. Okay, so if you have a smaller turbine, if you need a smaller turbine, you don't want to spend a lot of effort maintaining it, then this is a viable design. It's a viable design you can have. Okay. So the main disadvantage is mostly is that the speed of wind is very low. Okay, so this limits power. Okay, so the main sort of this sort of vertical axis is maintenance is easier, the control mechanism is easier. It's just that uh, you just don't get that much power if you're too close to ground. Okay, any questions about this time? So some of the microgrid designs, so the newer microgrid designs that incorporates wind will incorporate this type of wind turbine into it. Okay. Incorporate this type. Right. It's because you don't need to be very big. And this makes the construction, the maintenance, everything much easier. Okay. Yeah. How tall are they? So not very tall. So I will show you another picture, but you can think of the base as about, you know, a, as tall as a person. Yeah. So not, not super tall, not super tall. So the base is, you know, let's say two meters. So the whole thing maybe twenty meters or so. If you uh, if you're driving eastbound on I ninety right before you get to Ellensburg, there is one right next to the interstate that you can keep an eye out for next time anybody's driving that way. <laughs> yeah, so Mark says if you go to I ninety going east, you'll see this kind of turbine. The next time somebody gets to close to, I guess once they shove all the snow, they can look at, take a look at this turbine. Okay, so yeah, so you do see this popping up. Like it's a, it's a viable design if you don't need that much power. Okay. okay. So this is just emphasis again. Gearbox are 
really the pain when you have a wind turbine. Okay, so gearbox are heavy, expensive. There's a very common failure. This <laughs> is most common failure. Okay, most common failures are gearbox failures. Most common failures. Okay, so gearbox, you know, goes wrong a lot of times. You need to maintain them, you need to, you know, change the oil on them, you need to make sure the bearings are good. So all those are things, okay? So type four, which we won't get to for a few classes, but type four is really a type of turbine that's sort of newer turbines today. Right, so point of type four is to get rid of gearboxes. No gearbox. This replaces by uses pilotronics. Okay. So a lot of advancing pilotronics, especially high pilotronics, is directly towards the problem we have with gearboxes. And we cannot make you know, making good gearboxes hard. And nowadays we're better at making solid state. We're making a solid state pilotronics. So the first few types we cover in this class will have a gearbox. And then the last type will not have a gearbox. Okay. Just, uh, okay. okay, so just some pictures to get an idea of how big these things are. Okay, so these are these things are really, really big. Okay, so there's a picture of a turbine out there. So here, this is a mini van, right? So this is, you know, this is how tall a person would be. This is how tall a person would be. This is how big the turbines are. Okay, so when we say these are big machines, right? we're not kidding, these are big machines. Okay, so these are basically, this is a case, this is actual picture of people doing maintenance. This is the actual picture of people trying to do maintenance here. So what happens is, the blades are feathered. So feather means you're locking the blade and they don't rotate. Right? You don't want to you know, get too near to them when the blades are rotating. So we lock the blade. And then when you want to maintain the gearbox, it's your job to get up to here somehow. Okay? Try to get up to there. And uh, the machine just is just a huge machine. Yeah. And this is not very big today. 1.5 megawatt is a fairly small turbo. A lot. So today's turbines are today. So the new ones are 10 megawatt. Okay. So you can scale this whole thing up to 10 megawatt. Okay. So these are big, thick machines. Okay. You want to, right? So that's why, you know, you think the separation we covered, you may think, oh, a separation of factor of six or seven is large. It's not that large once you see the turbine. They're quite close to each other. You see it in the field. And the trend is to grow bigger and bigger. The turbines are getting bigger and bigger. So if you draw this uh, sort of year, let's say we start at uh, 1980, we end, at, we end at 2020. And so how big are the turbines? Well, they keep growing. So we started was about 50 kilowatts of turbine. By that time, we're building 50 kilowatts is considered a large turbine, actually, at the time. And then as we go up, this curve goes something like this as you track it along the years. Okay, so for example, 1995, we got to 500 kilowatts as large turbines. 2005, we got to 2 megawatt. And today we're getting to about 10 megawatt. Okay, so there's really exponential growth in how much power a turbine can generate. Okay, so we're now talking about 10 megawatt turbines for a single turbine. That's a rate of power for a single turbine. Okay, so these are getting larger and larger all the time. Okay. And uh, if you look at, you know, because they generate more power, they're just getting bigger in size. 
Uh, some of you have seen this comparison before. As a two megawatt turbine will sweep out a re region that's larger than a Boeing 747. Okay, so you can fit an entire 747 into the area that's uh, sweeped out okay, by the turbine. Okay. Right, so each turbine costs a lot of money. You have to build them very carefully, and uh, you need to control them very carefully. Okay. So if something breaks, imagine you have airplanes or flying towards you. If this thing breaks, okay. so this is actual picture of GE's turbine. Right. So with a 747 laid on top of it, going to give you a scale of how large these things are. So if you ever have a chance to visit, to get close to a turbine, I recommend you do that. I have feeling for the sort of real engineering projects people have building this kind of things. Okay. All right, so, and uh, we build a larger and larger blades. So this is a picture of sort of GE's turbines. We're getting the blades are getting longer and longer. Another picture showing if you put Statue of Liberty, it's smaller than a turbine. <laughs> so turbines are getting something that's, uh, yeah, they're really getting to be a little bit out of hand, the turbine sizes. And the longest one here is 100 meters. Okay, so if you look at the blade length, we're about a hundred meters long, the longest blade we have nowadays. Okay. All right, so this is the size we have today. All right, so the question is, can you get higher? Okay, can you, you know, can you have bigger blades? Right, if you build bigger blades, you can build taller towers, you can have, you know, more power out of turbine. So today we really cannot exceed a hundred meters long blade, at least on land. So we cannot go past this. We, we, it's hard to exceed a hundred meters long blade on land. To have more than hundred meters on land. Okay. It's very hard to build a turbine larger than, so this is about the larger, largest you can build. So eight megawatt is about as large as we can build on land. Okay. What's the constraint here? What's stopping us from building ever larger turbines on land? So there's two constraints here. Okay. Right, yeah. Yeah, so the first constraint is transport. You can't transport place over a highway. So the first hard limit is transport constraint. So most highways, you cannot have a truck that's, you know, transport a blade that's longer than 100 meters. You can't drive the blade from place to place. Okay, so that's a main constraint. There's another constraint. Yeah. When you think of other, con there's another constraint that uh, one is transport, you can't get it to where you want it. There's another sort of effect that happens when you offer the very large wind turbine. Okay. In the chat, you've got that uh, you can't lift the blades high enough to install them. Right. Yeah. So the, yeah. So okay. So let me lump that with construction. As I can, now we can do. So we we can sort of get around with that. But there's another. So what happens when you get near to a wind turbine? What do you notice when you get close to a wind turbine? Noise. Noise. It's actually very loud. So the larger the turbine, the louder the noise. Is. Once you get too large, the noise becomes um, a real issue. Even for the people, like if you're anywhere close to it, you really hear the turbine. And you build any larger, it'll be a jet engine uh, going on, like louder than a jet. So there's noise. The environmental impact really becomes a problem. It becomes very noisy. And even if you're far away, you'll hear it. And uh, so 
Right, we, we're really, it's hard to see we're gonna build any larger than the 100 meters. You may have very specialized locations you can build that, but mostly that sort of give you a limit of how much one power we can generate. So that puts a cap on sort of power per meter square, how much power we can get out of this lab. Okay. There's sort of real considerations there. Right, so this shows you an example of, you know, a blade with a truck. How do you get it there? So, you know, if this truck is stuck, what do you do? So all that happens, okay? Right, so that's sort of the mechanics of building turbines. And then as we covered before, as we offer the turbine, you want to offer it at a fairly constant uh, speed, right? So we have one power, what, you, what we want from the turbine is we want to generate some generate power in this fashion, right? Okay, so this is the output power. Okay, so getting this is again, not uh, trivial. Getting this is not trivial, but this is something we want. And we want the turbine with you know, fairly constant uh, rate of power. We can offer that rate of power for a long time. And when you buy a turbine, so this is actual turbine, the power curve, you see something like this. Okay, so if you go and buy this turbine, whenever you buy a turbine, they'll give you a curve. And so this thing, you know, kicks in at about uh, 10 miles per hour, has a fairly wide rate of power, then cuts off at about 60 miles per hour. Okay, so we actually, this is actual data sheet from this turbine. So how do you do that, right? So the question is, how do you get this generating behavior? Okay. So now we're gonna look at the, uh, how do we get electricity out of it? Okay. How do we get this power? How do we, how do we uh, get this kind of power curve? Okay. So I'm gonna assume that uh, we ha all have seen those two types of generators or two types of machines, an induction machine and a synchronous machine. So we review the basic equations, but I'm gonna assume that th this is not the first time you have heard the word, for example, induction machine. And so these are two things we can generate. We can uh, build turbines with, right? So you have never seen an induction generator. The induction generator or just induction motor run backwards. There's no difference between a for a machine between a generator and a low. It just which way you run it. So induction machines are you know the earlier types of turbines will use induction machines. The latest one will use synchronous generators, and we'll see why we we'll use. Right. And the main reason we want to get sort of more and more, uh, the main reason why turbines was not very good at the beginning is because we're using induction generator turbines. We're just using a pure induction generator as a turbine. Okay. So induction machine, uh, this is sort of the earlier, this is uh, early types. So you could run an induction machine. Induction, induction generators are really easy to build. They're really cheap. They're very reliable. Not much can go wrong in a generator. But the problem is if you just use an induction generator, so this is a induction generator. The problem with the induction generator is only offered at a very small range. Of slip. Okay, so if you remember from uh, 351 or equivalent course, when I talk about the uh, induction motors, as uh, this thing only offered at a tiny sort of small operating range. Okay. So we'll offer it as some slip, but only when the slip is in this range. Otherwise, either it won't offer it or the system is unstable. Okay, so we can build it, right? In the 70s, we did build a lot of turbines like this, but the problem, they only offer it at this tiny range. So they only offer it when wind is really at the right condition. So a lot of effort is to go from induction, this sort of small operating range, is to somehow get this to offer it at a bigger range. Okay, somehow get it offered at a bigger range. So if you 
want to operate an induction machine at a bigger range, what can you do? Now, the synchronous frequency, uh, the synchronous frequency determines your set. You can operate at only narrow amount of set. So how do you make an induction motor operate at a wider range? Okay, so this is what we'll see for type three turbos. Basically, how do you get a wider range of operation out of induction motor? Okay, so we don't want, basically, can we, you know, have a, what, yeah, can we sort of, uh, how, what do we do with the slip? Yeah. What do we do with the slip? So, so we can operate a wider range of slip. And so what we want is really sort of operate at a range, you know, something, a much wider range, something like this. Okay, so this is a variable speed. So we want to offer that variable speed, right? So that gives us a, you know, much better power profile. It's more cost efficient, it's more reliable for the grid and all that. Right, so we're in this class, we're gonna cover the fixed speed first. Then we'll go to the variable speed ones. And we'll cover the fixed speed ones first. The fixed speed ones are just induction, induction generators. Okay, so you take induction motor, you put it on the tower, you attach some blades to it and uh, get a gearbox and you run this. So these are, so this only offers So the operating range is small. Okay, so sort of have a small operating range, but has a lot of advantages. Right, this is just easy to build. This is easy to maintain. There's not much maintenance you need to do for induction. Generator. Okay, it's simple to operate. Just put it in and uh, let it run. Okay, so this is a. Okay, so this is a idea. This is sort of the early versions of the turbines we have are fixed, and the main reason because they're just induction motor. Okay, so there's fixed speed system. Then later we go into a variable speed system. Here we got a variable speed system. So this is we want to regulate power. Right. To get a variable speed system, you really need to re regulate power. You need to you know, generate, let's say roughly a same amount of power for a very large range of speed. Okay. So this is what we want. This also sort of lets the blade, uh, sort of run at lower speed. Blade uh, rotate at slower speed. So this is sort of less mechanical stress. Okay. It's sort of less mechanical stress. All right. So. You can generate power for a very large range of uh, possible wind speeds. And then because you have more control in the turbines, this is, so there's a lot of benefit to that. This is just as more expensive. It require a lot more control engineering that we have, okay. a lot more engineering. All right, so the last thing we'll do in this class is to sort of list all the types We'll list all the types and we'll go through them one by one. So the next few weeks is going through each one of them, building on top of each other and see how do you make a more and more uh, sophisticated turbine and when we go through this kind of types, all right? So the fixed speed, this is called type one. And this is just a induction, Generator 
And this is it, it's the induction generator through the grid. Grid that may have pitch control. Okay, so we may have pitch control, but this is it. So type one is induction generator. So what can go wrong? Let's say this were a type one generator. All right, so we're gonna successfully improve on different types, but type one is the most uh, obvious thing you will do is put induction generator and uh, run it to, to your grid. Okay? Connect to grid, we may, we may have some pitch control on the blaze. So what can possibly go wrong with type one? Other than efficiency, so it's not super efficient, but let's say we take that head, you know, what in terms of safety, what can go wrong with type one? Okay. Right, so the safety issue with type one is, for example, if you ever lose a connection to the grid, then you're really in trouble. There's nowhere for the power to go. So type two is really answer to that. If I have a temporary fault to the grid, so I could do pitch control, but that takes some time. It takes you know a few seconds to pitch the blade. I need, to, I need the turbine to survive in a few seconds. I don't want the turbine to blow up. Okay, so type two is a direct answer to that. So how will you deal with this problem? Let's say you connect to the grid, there's a fault on the line, there's a lightning strike, something. You lose that connection to the grid. How will you dump the power? In a very obvious way. <laughs> That's the most obvious solution you can think of. How do you get rid of this excess power? Any ideas? So the type two, the way we get rid of power is it's an induction motor, the an induction generator with added resistance. Okay, so the most obvious solution add a big resistor to it. If the grid cuts out, I can detect that and dump power through this resistor. And hopefully you don't melt that resistor. Okay, so that, that's a hope. But uh, let's add a resistor. Let's say, you know, let's hope this thing can survive a few seconds of faults. So this is one idea. So this is actually building to a lot of turbines. A lot, a lot of turbines will have a huge resistor. That's all there is is to dump power. So that, you may melt that resistor, but you know, you'll survive for a few seconds. What is, what is another drawback for induction generator? Think of back to when you're learning induction motor. In terms of reactive power, would an induction generator consume or provide reactive power? Consume, right? Induction generator has to consume reactive power because there's only inductors in it. If you look at the circuit diagram, there's only inductors. So it doesn't matter which way the active power flows. Reactive power it has to consume reactive power. Well, so thus, you know, you're not a very good generator if you have always consumed reactive power, right? Somebody has to provide that. So, you know, that creates some problems for the rest of the generator on the grid, okay? So this is, this we have, so now type three solves, you know, try to solve that problem. Basically try to compensate for reactive power. So this is called a doubly fed. This is called a doubly fed induction generator. What this does is creates another path for reactive power flow. 
So it goes a lot more detail, but the thing to know is this is this deals with reactive power. Yeah. They figures out a way to through powertronics to generate or at least not consume that much reactive power. Okay. So there's two, so that requires another flow of another path for electricity for current to flow. It's called a double shot. There's two connectors, two two lines coming out of it. Okay, so in type four, as people really sort of got tired of induction generators, and then we started using synchronous generators. Okay, right. So now there are some fundamental limits to an induction generator, being that you need a synchronous speed. Okay, so somebody has to give you a synchronous speed for an induction motor to work. And then if you really want to be a standalone generator, or you want to you know, provide reactive power like a synchronous generator, as you just put a synchronous generator in one turbo, in the turbo itself. Okay. All right, so so we'll stop here today. But so the rest, you know, for the next uh, at least the five six lectures, we'll start with type one. That's really really simple. It's just review of induction machines. We'll get an equation out of it. We'll build up to type two. We'll see how we add resistance. We'll build toward type three by adding another line, another connection. Okay. So that's our goal. Once we get to type four, that's actually really simple. It's a synchronous generator. And not much you say about synchronous generators or one equation, we're done with that, okay? So we're not learning four distinct types of generators. We're really learning building up towards type three, but adding towards a you know, induction machine. And then we'll look at type four. So that's a goal we have. And we'll probably have a midterm you know, some uh, either after we finish type four or you know, after we finish type three. That's sort of where the midterm will come. Okay. Questions, class? All right. So if not, I'll see you guys next Tuesday. Okay. So a reminder homework's due uh, tomorrow night.